welcome to everybody online as well to better protect in particular mangroves and peatlands through national climate change strategies. My name is Tim Christofferson. I coordinate the work on water, land, and climate at UN Environment. And I'm very pleased to moderate the session today where we have uh, two guest stars uh, and three high-level experts. So we have a powerful panel. Um, we have two ministers with us today. Our host, uh, Ola Elvestun, who's the Minister of Environment and Climate here in Norway, and Arlette Soudan Nounold, who is the Minister for Environment and Tourism in the Republic of Congo. Uh, I will also introduce our high-powered uh, panel of experts uh, later. Um, just before we start, we have been asked in this session to make sure we have enough time for a dialogue with the audience. Um, I will um, ask later when we start questions that uh, we bring questions from you online. The way this works in this conference is you use your mobile device, you go to the app that you all received a link to, and then you type in your questions. I uh, tried that yesterday in a session, and it took me quite some time to type the question on my phone, but it works well. So please do start already now to log any questions you might have. You can log comments during the discussion and during the debate, and then we will pull them up um, towards the, the second half of the event. Also, the minister from the Republic of Congo will speak in French. If you need translation, there are devices just outside the door. Now is probably a good time to get them uh, if, uh, if you need them. Without further ado, um, I would like to ask the Minister of uh, Environment and Climate, Ola Elvestun, to uh, open for us. Uh, Minister Elvestun is the deputy leader of the Venstre, the Liberal Party here in Norway. Uh, he has chaired the Committee on Environment and Energy in the Parliament <clears throat> between 2013 and 2017, so he's very familiar with many of these issues. He also, his team told me, and he just told me also, has a, has a passion for, for mangroves and, and wetlands, and I'm sure we will hear uh, something about that now and also in the panel discussion. Minister Elvestum, please, the floor is yours. Please welcome the Minister on stage. Thank you, and uh, good morning. Minister, and uh, excellencies, ladies and gen gentlemen. Uh, mangroves and peatlands are critical to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. Unfortunately, they have received too little attention. Therefore, I'm glad to give them well-deserved attention today. Uh, not only do mangroves and peatlands contribute to climate mitigation and adaptation, they are also crucial for protecting life below, below water and on land. Sustainable Development Goals 14 and 15. Protecting them is a win-win situation. Mangroves as seagrass meadows and kelp are actually far more effective carbon sinks than forests. And therefore also and very much relevant also here in Norway. So in my former capacity, I've been happy to, to, to start up uh, our own blue forest network. Uh, mangroves and peatlands store carbon and protect coastal areas for the benefit of people and animal life. During extreme weather events like storms and floods, mangroves prevent erosion and protect coastal infrastructure. More than 100 countries have mangroves. They cover more than 150,000 square kilometers, a little more than the size of Bangladesh, uh, or half the size of Italy. Home to a third of the world's mangroves, Indonesia has the largest mangrove mitigation potential for any country. Uh, about 30 million tons of carbon emissions could be avoided each year from that country alone, if their mangroves could be protected. That is more than half of Norway's emissions. Uh, West Papua province alone holds 70% of the country's mangroves, offering a unique opportunity to add to efforts at safeguarding intact forests and peatlands. A similar picture ex exists for tropical peatlands. They cover, cover little more than 440,000 square kilometers, the size of Sweden, but are the world's largest carbon stock on land. Drainage and fires in peatlands are responsible for 5 to 8 percent of the world's total greenhouse gas emissions. Other panelists 
we'll have more to say about how important these ecosystems are. So let me just take this opportunity to pay tribute to Indonesia for its uh, efforts to restore its vast peatlands. Norway is proud to support this effort as part of our climate and forest partnership. I also look uh, forward to listen to my esteemed colleague, uh, Minister Alet Suda Nuno, um, from the Republic of Congo. She will talk about the single largest peatland in the world in the Congo Basin. Uh, there are numbers of, there are a number of possibilities for these ecosystems to get proper national and international attention. As part of their environmental commitments, countries must work out strategies for mitigation and, adapt and ad adapting to climate change, safeguard biological diversity and reduce degradation of land. Protecting mangroves and peatlands can help countries deliver on all of these commitments. And in closing, let me just repeat that it is high time uh, we focus our attention to these ecosystems. They have been neg neglected for, uh, or actively done away with to make way for short-term economic development. Uh, let's hope it will not take another tsunami or another round of peat fires to appreciate them properly. We, only, we really have to, to take stock on peatlands, on mangroves, but also on the blue forest areas that are in countries like Norway, we also have a great uh, potential for storing carbon also here and need to have a proper and better policy for it. So with that, I say thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Herbestuhn. And um, uh, indeed, these ecosystems cover comparatively small areas of land, but both in terms of the carbon they store and their ecosystem services, mangroves and peatlands are extraordinarily important. We will hear more about uh, that from our panel of experts. Um, I would now like to ask uh, Alet uh, Sudan Nunold, who is the Minister of Tourism and Environment in the Republic of Congo. Um, Alet uh, worked also as a journalist in the 1990s, um, and held the position of press secretary to the presidency of the Republic of the Congo from 1992 to 97. She um, is a strong advocate for the management of peatlands. I had the pleasure of observing that myself during the signing of the Brazzaville Declaration, which focuses on protecting the Cuvette Centrale. So we're very happy to have you here, Minister, and uh, please welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you. Monsieur le, Monsieur le Ministre, chers collègues, chers experts, Mesdames et Messieurs, merci Tim pour ces mots chaleureux d'accueil. Mon pays, la République du Congo, 342 000 km, au cœur du bassin du Congo, deuxième poumon écologique mondial après l'Amazonie, renferme la troisième plus grande superficie de forêt tropicale dense humide de l'Afrique avec 23,5 millions d'hectares, soit 69% du territoire national et environ 12% du massif forestier du bassin du Congo. À l'image des autres États membres de la Commission des forêts d'Afrique centrale, Institution spécialisée de la communauté économique des États de l'Afrique centrale, le Congo a obtenu des résultats intéressants en matière de gestion durable des forêts. Près de 13 de son territoire sont consacrés aux aires protégées. Le taux de, taux de déforestation est de 0,052 dans la période entre 2000 et 2012. Près de 6 millions, 64 446 millions d'hectares de concessions affectées à l'exploitation forestière sont aménagées. Environ 2,67 millions d'hectares de ces concessions forestières aménagées bénéficient d'une certification FSC. Monsieur le ministre, mesdames et messieurs, 
Dans le cadre de la lutte contre les changements climatiques, la République du Congo est partie à la Convention cadre des Nations unies sur les changements climatiques et a adhéré au processus de réduction des émissions issues de la déforestation et de la dégradation des forêts, RED+, depuis 2000 plus, 2008. À ce titre, notre pays a élaboré sa stratégie nationale, RED+, qui a par ailleurs été approuvée par le gouvernement. Il en est de même d'un plan d'investissement de cette stratégie, avec l'appui du programme d'investissement forestier, PIF, et de l'initiative pour les forêts d'Afrique centrale, CAFI. Cette stratégie prend également en compte les tourbières, ces écosystèmes très fragiles. La problématique des tourbières a émergé après la révélation par des chercheurs de l'université de Linz dans la revue Nature en 2017 de leur existence dans la cuvette centrale du bassin du Congo. Cette dernière couvre la République du Congo et la République démocratique du Congo. Il s'agit notamment du paysage transfrontalier de la binationale Lac Télé et Lac Tumba. Elles sont parmi les plus importantes au monde de la zone tropicale humide. Leur superficie est de 145 500 km, représentant trois fois celle de la Belgique et contiennent 30 milliards de tonnes de carbone, soit l'équivalent de 15 à 20 ans d'émissions toxiques de COD des États-Unis. Si ces tourbières ne sont pas gérées durablement, elles représentent une bombe à retardement qui risque d'accélérer le changement climatique et compromettre les dispositions de l'accord de Paris. Conscientes de ces enjeux écoclimatiques pour le monde, nos deux États, la République du Congo, la République démocratique du Congo, ont décidé de conjuguer leurs efforts pour gérer durablement ces écosystèmes particuliers. Avec l'appui technique de l'ONU Environnement, nous avons organisé du 21 au 23 mars à Brazzaville 2018 la troisième réunion de l'initiative mondiale sur les tourbières. Les travaux de Brazzaville ont débouché sur une déclaration qui engage les pays à travailler de manière concertée pour une gestion durable des tourbières. Une feuille de route de mise en œuvre de cette déclaration a été adoptée. Parmi les activités retenues figure la mise en place, aussi bien au niveau bilatéral qu'au niveau national, des cadres de concertation multisectoriels et multi-acteurs au niveau politique, diplomatique, juridique, scientifique, institutionnel et opérationnel pour une gestion durable des tourbières. Mais nous reviendrons là-dessus, je pense, pendant le panel. La République du Congo s'y attelle déjà. À titre d'exemple, le gouvernement a décidé de mettre en place un comité scientifique de haut niveau afin de permettre au pays d'améliorer sa compréhension de cet écosystème riche en biodiversité. Monsieur le ministre, mesdames et messieurs, pour terminer, je saisis cette occasion pour dire que nos pays, la République du Congo, la République démocratique du Congo, dans le cadre de la coopération bilatérale et multilatérale, ainsi que la solidarité internationale, au regard des enjeux des tourbières, ces écosystèmes fragiles ont besoin du soutien et de l'accompagnement de la communauté internationale, des bailleurs de fonds, des partenaires techniques et financiers et des donateurs pour la mise en œuvre de la déclaration de Brazzaville. Je voudrais m'adresser particulièrement à l'Agence norvégienne de coopération pour le développement, NORAD, la Banque mondiale, ONU Environnement, pour la mise à disposition des fonds afin de soutenir les efforts déjà consentis aussi bien par la République démocratique du Congo que par la République du Congo, mon pays, pour la préservation des tourbières dans l'intérêt du climat, des populations de la planète et du développement économique de nos deux États. Nous avons également besoin d'un accompagnement technique et financier pour résoudre le conflit gestion durable 
de ces écosystèmes des tourbières, des mangroves que la République du Congo a également, et exploitation des énergies fossiles présentes dans la zone d'une part et d'autre part, de renforcer la coopération sud-sud avec l'Indonésie, le Pérou, afin de faciliter l'échange d'expériences et le partage de leçons apprises dans la gestion des tourbières. C'est maintenant qu'il faut agir et nous devons agir ensemble. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Ministre. Thank you very much for um, framing the issue and also reminding us of the global importance of the Cuvette Centrale, which indeed is the largest tropical peatland discovered to date, discovered surprisingly recently or mapped in its entirety uh, only last year um, in an article in Nature and containing uh, about 30 gigatons of, of carbon, indeed a huge amount, and we cannot afford to uh, ignore peatlands or mangroves for the success of the Paris Agreement. We, um, before I ask the panel to come upstairs, I think we have a few um, maps just to frame the issue of where peatlands and mangroves uh, are found. <coughs> and uh, if I could ask uh, to bring up um, the maps now, I would like to um, point out that peatlands are found in 180 countries in the world, and much of the peatlands are actually in temperate and boreal zones. So this is not only a tropical issue, but it's an issue where North and South have to collaborate because in the North, in the European Union uh, in particular, peatlands have been exploited and overused for centuries. Uh, and it's still a large contribution to the emissions of the EU. So this is also a topic for European countries. And how can we help countries such as the Republic of Congo to make sure they make better choices and uh, can enjoy economic growth without degrading the peatlands? I chair a, a little group called the Global Peatlands Initiative, which the Minister um, Alet mentioned. Uh, we bring together now uh, 24 different organizations, and we have four pilot countries, Peru, Indonesia, the Republic of Congo, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, to make sure we can learn from each other, and these countries have the best possible advice, and we speak with one voice uh, in terms of scientific and technical advice. So this map is an outcome of the Global Peatlands Initiative. Next year, we will do a more in-depth mapping of global peatlands. Um, if I can have the next uh, slide, including action to be taken and supporting the governments on the Cuvette Centrale, which uh, you can see here on the map uh, spanning both uh, the Congos. Next map, please. Mapping the uh, extent of peatlands is one issue, but mapping their threats is another challenge. There are already uh, concessions that are given out in, for example, the Cuvette Centrale. Of course, Indonesia uh, has a long history of uh, using peatlands and has some very hard-earned lessons of what not to do. And Indonesia, I think, now is in a position to share these lessons, and we're very pleased that The Minister of Indonesia has invited uh, Minister Sudan Onold and her colleague from the Re Democratic Republic of Congo to come to Indonesia at the end of August and uh, this year to uh, learn more about how peatlands can be conserved and restored. Next slide. Peatlands and also um, mangroves are found in almost all the Red Plus partner countries that Norway uh, and many many of us have been working with and, and working for now for many years. Mangroves cover less than half a percent of all forests in the world, yet uh, they are not only a huge carbon store, but also hugely important for ecosystem services. We will hear uh, from our experts uh, a little bit more about that later. Next slide, please. Mangroves um, are, of course, uh, distributed more across the tropics, and it's a more tropical issue. Uh, nevertheless, we will hear also about the adaptation value uh, of mangroves, not only the carbon mitigation value in this discussion. Next. <coughs> And with that um, brief framing, I would like to bring our experts uh, to the stage. I will introduce them one by one as they uh, come up. And if I 
uh, can start with Professor Catherine Lovelock, who is a professor of biology at the University of Queensland. Her research focuses on climate change and the impacts on coastal plant communities. She's a member of the scientific working group of the Blue Carbon Initiative and also um, leads projects in Australia and Myanmar on coastal adaptation and carbon sequestration and the restoration of mangroves. She's also an IPCC lead author, so I think we could not have gotten a better experts on mangroves for the panel today. Welcome, Catherine. If I can ask uh, Pan Nazir Fouad uh, next, who is the director of the Peatland Restoration Agency in Indonesia, he was asked by the president to head that agency in January 2016. And he has probably the, one of the hardest tasks in the world. Pan Nazir's task is to ensure Indonesia can restore two million hectares of peatlands by the year 2020. That's a monumental task. Luckily, he's not alone, he's supported by uh, many organizations um, and, of course, the ministry and government of Indonesia. He was head of the Climate and Land Use Alliance grants uh, program in Indonesia prior to becoming director of the Restoration Agency and conservation director at WWF, uh, heading a team of, of 300 staff. So coming from the NGO world into the government um, and leading this important agency. Bagnazi, I, I have a number of questions later to you on the policy process in, in Indonesia. Welcome, it's great to have you here. <laughs> Last but not least, uh, Daniel Modiasso, who is principal scientist at the Center for International Forestry Research and professor at Bogor Agricultural University. Daniel's research focuses on land use change and climate change and geophysical cycles. He has more than 100 articles published in high-impact uh, peer-reviewed journals, um, impressive scientific track record. He has been an advisor for the World Bank and also a lead author of several IPCC reports. He was part of the 2007 IPCC team that received the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, since we are in Oslo. Um, and uh, he was also Deputy Minister of the Environment, 2001 to 2002, so a uh, man who clearly knows how to bridge the science policy divide. Welcome, Daniel. <laughs> now, um, we have um, about um, 20 minutes, 25 minutes to uh, follow up with a few questions to the panel before we hand it over to the audience. Uh, and again, you can type uh, your questions on your conference app, and you can already start doing that now. We will also, for those who prefer that, uh, perhaps have the opportunity to ask questions with a, with a microphone, but please also use the app to type your questions. Now, um, I, would, I would like to ask um, our, our host uh, first uh, with a follow-up question to what you said. Um, we, um, We've, we see that you have a personal interest in this topic, in, in wetlands and, and mangroves, but where, where does that come from? <laughs> well, I can have a personal interest in many things <laughs> when it comes to environmental questions. But for me, the eye-openers really when I learned how much carbon mangrove forests actually store. And I understand also the same with seagrass meadows, with kelp. And, uh, and this is an area where we can really make an impact when it comes to storing carbon, but on the other side, on the other side, it also has so much. It's got to do with one thing is mitigating, but it's also to keep the forest also in a warming world with the increased uh, storms and everything. That that will also help. And and of course, it's also about economic development. That with mangrove forest, you 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 preserve also the the fisheries and the life within the mangrove forest. So it's kind of like it's an it's an area where where you can. It's in a, in a relatively easy way. You can uh, you can reach so many different goals. So that is really uh, the introduction for for myself. But it's also as a, with the best uh, policies that you work on, you can work very locally here in uh, Norway. So uh, we started the the Blue Forest Network here, and you can work to the to the largest international. Uh, questions. So it's um, so that's basically where it comes from. And Norway is already doing a lot on these issues, of course, since many years. Uh, what do you think uh, could be done, perhaps more specifically on these high carbon, high ecosystem service value uh, ecosystems? 
Well, we have to do our, our homework, so we are also working, so we have a motion then a, to, to, to uh, stop the transition from peatlands to uh, agriculture here in Norway that's going through the, th that's going through the, through the motions, uh, so that will get there. We're stopping also the, um, the production of peat uh, that's still being used, that is uh, an area that we have here, but we also have a work on, on planning for our keeping our own wetlands. Because uh, here too, like the rest of Europe, I think we have lost about 50% for the last 60 years. So we have to become better. But then internationally, uh, it is so that peatlands and mangroves have a, have a, um, it becomes a more important part in the, in the partnerships we have with countries in, uh, that we have to, with our rainforest countries that we, that we work with. Uh, and also on the other side, I think it is, with the blue forest, it is, I do not have the answer to just how, but I think definitely we could do much more than we do today. Thank you very much. If I may turn uh, to Minister uh, Sudan Nomold, you have mentioned that you need to collaborate with the Republic, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, because the Cuvet Central is a transboundary ecosystem. How exactly do you think that could work? Because, I mean, um, that region and also, um, in particular, that remote ecosystem, it might not be easy to work with the, with the government on the other side of the river. How do you think this could work? Écoutez, je, je tenais uh, tout d'abord à vous dire que c'est quelque chose d'assez déjà nouveau pour les deux États. Je l'ai rappelé tout à l'heure, nous venons de, par euh, le biais des chercheurs de l'Université de Linz, découvrir euh, cette, euh, ces écosystèmes très fragiles, auxquels, en fin de compte, nous avons cohabité pendant des siècles sans les avoir dégradés. Parce qu'il faut le souligner, elles sont intactes à l'heure actuelle. Elles sont vraiment intactes. Et quand nous avons compris que ce sont des bombes à retardement, les deux États, la République démocratique du Congo et mon pays, le Congo, parce que souvent les gens se demandent qu'est-ce que c'est la République démocratique du Congo C'est quoi le Congo Le Congo Brazzaville, la capitale est Brazzaville, c'est 4 millions et demi d'habitants. La RDC dans la capitale est Kinshasa, l'ancien Zahir, pour ceux qui l'ont connu ainsi, c'est plus de 70 millions d'habitants. C'est un mastodonte, c'est un pays continent. Mais nous avons quelque chose en commun que je n'ai pas relevé tout à l'heure, Nous avons le deuxième plus grand fleuve du monde après l'Amazonie, de par son débit, ce majestueux fleuve Congo, qui est pratiquement, je pense, j'en suis certaine maintenant, avec un peu l'échange d'expérience que nous avons eu pendant l'IMT avec la ministre de l'Indonésie, qui nous a fait l'honneur d'être présente sur le, votre initiative, votre organisation, qui nous a appris qu'il faut déceler le réservoir d'eau qui permet de maintenir humide ces zones Ramsar. Et nous comprenons maintenant que Même la gestion de la problématique de drainage du lac Tchad peut, dé, peut découler de la bonne gestion des tourbières si nous arrivons à gérer le système d'eau qui irrigue et qui maintient ces zones humides. Et donc, avec la République démocratique du Congo, nous avons le cadre de la commission climat du bassin du Congo, où il y a près de 12 États qui ont signé un mémorandum d'entente pour œuvrer dans la préservation de ces écosystèmes fragiles, a également la gestion, nous avons également la gestion de ce fleuve et de ces tourbières inscrits tant dans les déclarations de Brazzaville que dans les différentes déclarations que nous avons dans le cadre de la commission climat du bassin du Congo, dont nous avons eu notre premier sommet le mois dernier en présence de Sa Majesté le Roi du Maroc et douze chefs d'État pour vous montrer que cette problématique si importante d'adaptation, d'atténuation de tout ce qui est changement climatique Euh, euh, engage au plus haut niveau les gouvernants de nos États. Et pour revenir essentiellement à votre question, mais nous avons signé à Brazzaville une déclaration tripartite à laquelle certainement j'ai proposé à nos amis de l'Indonésie, lorsque nous nous rendrons du 20 au 24 août au prochain, que le Pérou, membre de l'IMT de l'Initiative mondiale pour les tourbières, puisse également, je pense, signer, parce qu'ils étaient attendus, mais n'ont pas pu être présents. Je pense qu'il y a eu un glissement dans l'organisation gouvernementale qui a fait que la nouvelle ministre n'a pas pu nous rejoindre, mais ce n'est que partie remise, parce que nous sommes, j'aime bien le dire ce mot, 
Nous sommes condamnés à œuvrer ensemble. On n'a pas le choix. Donc avec la République démocratique du Congo, il y a deux aspects. Il y a l'aspect interne des gouvernants qui doivent mettre en place des cadres internes de prise en compte de ces écosystèmes très fragiles, des tourbières et euh, également des mangroves que nous avons. Et nous devons également, sur le plan interna euh, euh, bilatéral, à ce moment-là, cela a été déjà euh, arrêté dans le cadre de la déclaration de Brazzaville, mettre un cadre de concertation commun qui nous permette d'avancer communément pour l'intérêt, pas seulement de nos États, je vous le rappelle, mais pour la planète entière. Parce que nous ne sommes pas en dehors de la planète. 145 500 carrés de tourbières, 30 milliards de gigatonnes de fonds carbone, nous sommes obligés de joindre nos forces pour aller vers les partenaires enfin, afin de trouver une solution pour pouvoir atteindre ces objectifs de l'accord de Paris. Donc euh, nous y travaillons euh, de façon étroite avec les collègues de la RDC. L'invitation commune a été formulée. Nous, normalement, si tout se passe bien, parce qu'il y a aussi des élections là-bas pour décembre, et nous savons ce qui s'y passe, j'espère que le collègue qui n'a pas pu être présent ici nous rejoindra, je pense, en Indonésie, afin que nous puissions poursuivre ce que, pendant Brazzaville, nous avons fait, parce que n'oubliez pas que nous avons co-présidé l'IMT, la troisième conférence de Brazzaville. Oui. Et donc, nous avons 11 points qui ont été arrêtés et nous sommes actuellement simplement dans la mise en œuvre de cette feuille de route. Et je l'ai rappelé tout à l'heure, nous avons la, 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 la vie nationale que nous avons en commun sur le plan frontalier. Voilà. Indeed, uh, thank you. The Brazzaville Declaration lists a number of points uh, to better protect the Cuvette Centrale, um, and yet at the same time there are already some exploratory oil and gas concessions, uh, especially on the Democratic Re Republic of the Congo, not so much in, in, in your country. Um, there are uh, possible logging concessions, so there is increasing pressure and threats on these, on these peatlands. I'll, I'll come back to you later on how we can specifically deal with that and also encourage the audience to to ask uh, questions to the minister and the panel. Um, let me l first come um, now a little bit, we've sp spoken about peatlands quite a bit, um, to mangroves, which is another very important topic. And um, uh, Catherine uh, Lovelock, if you could outline for us in a nutshell, why should we care about mangroves? You could probably talk about that for a long time, I'm, I'm <laughs> sure, but <laughs> what are the key ecosystem services we need to preserve here? Well. Um I'm so lucky because I get to tell you how amazing mangroves are, and they are amazing. So we're here to discuss, well, the initial discussion was about their carbon values, and they have carbon stocks that are about four times that of rainforest, and most of it is uh, within their soil. So in Indonesia, for example, it's uh, about a thousand tonnes of carbon per hectare in the, the mangrove soils. So, but it's not only that, it's this sort of broad range of uh, ecosystem services that they provide. So we, if we examine how they actually get that much carbon, I mean, how are those stocks formed? And really what it was is like a master stroke of evolutionary innovation that these tropical trees basically invaded the intertidal zone. So what happened is they brought with them all of those carbon-rich compounds of lignin and cellulose in their wood and in their roots and deposited this in these very waterlogged saline soils of the intertidal zone where decomposition is really, really slow. So over time, what happens is that these carbon stocks are accumulated. And in addition to that, the tide, of course, is bringing sediments So we have sediments burying lots and lots of organic <coughs> matter in the intertidal zone. And this has occurred in some places for, you know, the last 10,000 years that sea level has risen. So we have this accumulation in some places of over six metres of this sort of organic soils in mangroves. So this is really why they are so important for carbon, but they are also there I'm describing the importance for climate change adaptation. They are able to keep pace with sea level. 
as it uh, goes up. So they're really important for those. Even with the current pace of sea level rise, mangroves... Well, there, are some, there is some capacity. In the past, you yeah. can see that mangroves have kept up with sea level rise of up to four to five millile millimetres, even in the Caribbean, where sediments are very low supply. All right? So there's some you know, like optimism in that statement. Right? But that also links to one of their other ecosystem services, and that is in improving water quality or maintaining water quality. Basically, they trap sediments, and in that process, they, they're really good at nutrient cycling, and they are responsible for a lot of denitrification. So with increases in nutrients to the coastal zone, they're actually contributing to that reduction in nitrogen, right? which is good for our other systems, good for seagrasses, good for coral reefs, good for all of those adjacent marine systems. So the next thing we really have to talk about, though, is uh, biodiversity, right? Because they're really very important for both terrestrial and marine biodiversity. So we can think of the big iconic creatures, right? So tigers in the Sundarbans, fabulous. Estuarine crocodiles, you know, throughout Australia and Southeast Asia and Cuba. And uh, then organisms like sea turtles and endangered... Uh, so shovel nose rays in some places, right? So they're really important for these big creatures. But then the big component, or there's a component of biodiversity, that is fisheries, right? And there, it, fish production, whether it's from within the mangroves, so crabs and shellfish, that are often the, 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 the gathering grounds of women of these communities, particularly throughout uh, the Pacific. So these are really important, both for subsistence and also for market value. But then also they support the inshore fisheries. So, you know, in Australia, 70% of our commercial fisheries, the organisms spend some time in the mangrove, right, at some point in their life cycle. They are important nursery grounds. So, so if, that's if they're so important, why are they being replaced by shrimp farms? What is the basic policy failure? Again, it's probably c country by country and local it, by local. It, uh, it is, and there's been context, some hard but lessons. Synthesize. What is the main policy failure here? Why are they being replaced? Uh, because aquaculture has been seen as a you know is the, as a silver bullet for a lot of countries who want to increase their food production relatively rapidly. Now, the thing is, though, aquaculture has been prone to disease, reductions in water quality. It has uh, led to dis you know, displaced indigenous people. There's a, and also, then, they become exposed, more exposed to climate change. There's a whole raft of issues there, I think. And I think one of the hardest lessons was learnt by the Philippines, where they converted so much of their mangroves, and Park Daniel can speak to this as well, um, that their artisanal fishery crashed you know, because they had a removal of the mangroves, overfishing, and, you know, you get this sort of cocktail of events that they are now busy trying to peg their way back by restoring the mangroves and trying to improve uh, those kinds of conditions, right, that are in the coastal zone. So there's that one more. Can I go one more for the one more. system services? <laughs> Actually, I've got two more, but I'll sneak in. <laughs> so the, the one more, of course, is coastal protection. This comes up time and time again as an important uh, issue. And it's not that mangroves are resistant to being smashed by a cyclone, of course they're not, but if you, um, it, but, but they do all of that beautiful structure, those you know, gorgeous aerial roots and stems and dense stems, they provide this sort of um, big friction, uh, offer a lot of friction to waves and wind uh, energy. So if you want to protect your infrastructure, even if it's a seawall, it, beho it behooves you to keep your mangroves in front of it, yeah. right? So actually this is if all it's about... Actually, if it's a kind of seawall that uh, grows with sea level rise, that's actually, uh, mm. of course, a very but good investment. I would like to turn to the policy uh, side of things now. I think the, uh, you've, you've made a very convincing case <laughs> about the importance of, of mangroves. So how can we um, design our policies better, because that's the title of the strategy, to protect mangroves, protect peatlands, and I think Indonesia has... Um, a lot of experience in both aspects, um, turning now again more to peatlands. Uh, Park Nasir, what are the main lessons that Indonesia could share with countries like the Republic of Congo um, in, uh, in your experience on this topic? Yeah, well, uh, thank you. 
I think we have to, uh, unfortunately, go back to 2015 and previous El Nino years, where we have hit very uh, badly uh, because of the fires. And we learned a lot. It has been reminded by scientists, by activists, but in the end, you know, the government fully realized, see it, uh, their firsthand experience that when mangrove was destroyed, degraded, and when it's burned, it is almost impossible to put the fire out uh, unless we have uh, heavy rain. So we dramatically changed how the way we see mang uh, peatland on this case, peatland, and create a new policy on protecting the peatland and forcing the moratorium very effectively and so on. And it worked because it comes from the president. So high the chain command in the country, the president himself uh, looked this as an issue, personal interest, uh, setting up uh, institutions that direct uh, report to him under, under his leadership and giving instruction directions to all government officials. So that I think is number one um, and it can work. Um, helping coordinate policies and trying to uh, harmonize different interests in the local government, in the provincial government, other agency and ministries, because the coordination uh, is through uh, at the highest level in the country. I have to say also that Indonesia, uh, with the support, uh, technical support from multilateral agency and scientists, we have mapped our pit land uh, back in 1980s and 1990s. Uh, though the scale and the accuracy of the map is not that great, but at least it serves as a first basis for policy formulations on how those area map as pit land, which area have to be fully protected, which area can be for limited use of uh, cultivations, and which area that we can work with communities. The map is there, although it's not very accurate. After uh, 2015, after uh, the agency or pit land restoration agency uh, set up by the president, uh, our first job is also to improve this map quality. So we got uh, strong support from Norway, thank you. Uh, in improving and we start mapping more accurately and uh, new policy which have been set up by the president and the minister can be more refined based on this uh, more accurate uh, map. What do you need from the private sector to make sure the moratorium really works? I mean, if in an ideal world, uh, what, what would they do yeah. uh, over and above what they're required? Uh, and sometimes they're not even doing that, but uh, what should they do in an ideal world? Yeah, let me start by saying that Indonesia have about 15 million hectares of peatland, and about half is still intact and in great shape. About half has been opened, degraded to some degrees. Um, when the president asked this agency to restore two million hectares, we set up a methodologies and criteria on how to prioritize two out of the seven million degraded. And we're coming up with even 2.5 million that needs to be fully uh, restored because it's a priority areas uh, for many reasons. And community uh, holds about 4,000 hectares of this 2.5 million. Government, central or local government control about 600,000, so altogether 1 million. 1.4 million is under concession holders, under private sector. Then, of course, they are a very important partner that we need to work together to get these two million hectares of government uh, presidential target. Um, we've seen that in the past, a few companies have tried to operate their forestry or plantation businesses by controlling the water table. Uh, a lot don't care at all, just doing the peatland as fast as they can and plant the crops. Some companies try to uh, uh, monitor and uh, manage the water table. Though, of course, from the perspective of the government, avoiding uh, huge greenhouse gas emission, uh, avoiding uh, risk of fire hazard and so on, we are asking the companies to manage it even much better than what they have done. Even the best company claim they have done a great job, for us it's not enough. We need to raise the bar. And that can be done because uh, of a government regulation signed by the president and then follow up by the operating regu regulation from the Minister of Environment and Forestry issuing uh, four ministerial regulations and two ministerial decrees uh, within only a few months after 
the president signed the regulations uh, for peatland protection and restoration. So that served as the baseline for the company. Of course, the company um, need a lot of assistance on how they have to adapt, they have to revise their management plan. And uh, we have also a bunch of scientists in Indonesia and a cooperation with uh, global uh, researchers from Europe, from American continent, Australia, Japan, who has a lot of experience in, in peatland, and bringing up this also technological support um, on how to revise the management plan of company who have legitimate licenses operating in that area. Um, things are moving on the right track. Uh, more research needs to be done. Uh, for example, the research to find the best compromise in terms of crop are still growing for communities or for companies. Reductions of the greenhouse gas emission will be maximum. Subsidence uh, prevention also will be maximum or at least subsidence. We believe the formula can be fine. And now we are doing the research. We hope uh, by the end of this year, we have the first results of how uh, the compromise can be found. And that will be used to change, I believe, a bigger policy on agriculture, on plantations, and on land development. What, what strikes me in particular in Indonesia with uh, many of the peatlands are low-lying coastal peatlands, uh, relatively close to the coast, and the issue of subsidence is, um, is critical to the future of that land altogether. Uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you here have eaten Gouda cheese, and the uh, city of Gouda in the Netherlands is solidly based on peatlands, and it sinks into the ground a few centimeters every year. Um, and that has been going on for quite a number of years. In the tropics, that process of decomposition of peatlands and land subsidence is much, much faster. So many of these drained peatlands, low-lying coastal peatlands, they're sinking into the sea, actually. They're being infiltrated by seawater. Daniel, has anybody done an economic analysis of uh, land subsidence and the loss of, of that huge landmass to Indonesia? What's the economic damage? I didn't expect this. <laughs> no, I, I, know, I, I, I said we had two other questions <laughs> I was going to ask you. So anyway, out from, of the blue. from the ongoing studies by TEB, I learned that restoration cost is much, much higher in peatland compared with mangrove. So in terms of uh, benefit cost ratio, uh, in mangrove is 25 times than the cost. So think about restoring mangrove, and in restoring peatland, you only get, I don't know, five, five six times? So that's, that's the scale of uh, the cost in terms of restoring. So if I think that, that, that is an important lesson, of course, that conservation is much cheaper than restoration, which costs a lot of money, um, and uh, luckily the Cuvette Central is still a very intact uh, tropical peatland. Mm. C4 does a lot of research um, uh, both around mangroves and around peatlands. Um, let me ask you one question about uh, MRV. I'm sure that, that acronym uh, for the initiated um, measuring, reporting, and, and verification under the Climate Convention. Um, can we completely um, measure if we fully integrate peatlands and mangroves in national climate strategies in the nationally determined contributions? Can we yeah. uh, have a enough accurate information to do that? Right. So before we do that, I think what we need to uh, realize is that the driver of change, the driver of degradation is different between the two ecosystems. Uh, most of uh, peatland are driven by agriculture. And as uh, Kath mentioned, aquaculture is driving a lot in the uh, mangrove part. So if you address this uh, driver, that, that would be very important in the MRV processes. But uh, in terms of scale, let, let me add on, on the numbers that uh, Kath mentioned. Um, the minister mentioned that we have a lot of mangrove in Indonesia. A quarter of the, the world mangrove is in Indonesia. It's 3 million hectares. It's the size of Belgium. But the rate of deforestation due to aquaculture is massive. 52,000 uh, hectares per year. And that costs a lot of emission, especially the, the soil carbon. And uh, 3 billion uh, ton annually will be released. And that is equal to 40 million fewer cars on the road. So think about that when you are talking about 
emission reduction from, from fossil fuel. That is only from mangroves in Indonesia? Only from mangroves. In fact, the, the deforestation rate is only 6% of the entire uh, land use change. But the contribution, if you manage to, to mitigate that, is 30% of land-based emission. So 200 million a year, with a total uh, deposit of 3 billion uh, ton of carbon in mangrove. Now, uh, I can interject about the study of the economics. Yes, okay. The Minister of Economic Affairs, for the Minister of Economic Affairs in Indonesia, uh, one year and a half ago, did this analysis of more on the fires. So comparing the co economic loss because of the fire, uh, mostly in pit, pit land, with the cost is needed for prevention. And the results that they're coming up is one compared 25 times. So for one hectare, if we uh, invest $10 uh, in preventing uh, the fire doing pit restoration and so on, we will save uh, $10, $250. For avoiding the, the the cost, 25 times. And I, I, I think uh, Indonesia has made a lot of progress in preventing fires through better systems, quicker response systems. The provinces have invested more, so we've luckily seen quite a drop in fire incidences in in Indonesia. Um, uh, Daniel, the, the C4, I find the Center for International Forestry Research uh, always quite fascinating because you not only research um, the uh, biophysical or the biological sciences of forests, but you also do policy research mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit. So uh, can I um, follow up to the, the question I, I asked uh, Catherine earlier? What, in a nutshell, are the key policy recommendations you would give to uh, countries with significant peatlands and mangroves to integrate them into their climate uh, strategies? Well, we, we build a quite significant critical mass for mangrove uh, these days. And we are planning to have a Blue Carbon Summit next month. And this will bring all together the, the scientific community and also policy community across sectors. And I underline this because mangrove is seen by different kind of sectors in different ways. So we would like to bring them together in, in, in this summit and expect to, to discuss, especially on mangrove, uh, across sectors. Because the interests are different. And again, as I said, that the drivers are different. One wants to do it for tourism, one for aquaculture, another one just for protection. So where to go? I think uh, we need to, to sit together and find the right policy advice and answer all the objectives of uh, these stakeholders. So it's up online now. The Blue Carbon Summit will be in 17 and 18 of, of July. That is for Indonesia specifically. So you will discuss those policies for Indonesia yes. and um, hopefully... The focus is Indonesia, but we try to link lessons. it with global initiative mm -hmm. like Blue Carbon Initiative, International Partnership for Blue Carbon, SDG, NDC, and, and those kind of stuff. Because, you know, uh, SDG 14 is, is about life below water. Catherine, you're in the International Blue Carbon Group, uh, the Gl Blue Carbon Initiative. Um, what, what is that initiative about and um, what, what do you do? We, well, we meet annually, but what we've done actually is to really try and advance the science around blue carbon. So if you look at the group, the output's been kind of fairly phenomenal, I would say. So, you know, we've published on stocks in seagrasses, maps of salt marshes, carbon in salt marshes, um, uh, risks of emissions. We've done a whole suite of uh, work. But one thing I think the, the group has been particularly successful is in um, uh, uh, the IPCC arena where the, the wetland supplement, which gives guidance to countries on how to account for transitions of their, for, for their blue carbon ecosystems. I mean, that was published in 2014. So the supplement's um, up there and really, but it hasn't really been adopted. So one of the, um, well, at least very widely, there's a couple of countries who are working on adopting the wetland supplement. But that, I, I see that as really critical to introducing these ecosystems into national inventories, right? So I think that's a really critical step. And the International Partnership for Blue Carbon actually next month is having a workshop to try and increase the the uptake and provide more information to countries about how they might go about introducing these ecosystems into their national accounts, right? And I also see that as a really 
you know, necessary link for Red Plus, but also um, for inclusion within the NDCs and other mm. um, <coughs> and other aspects. Let, let one, one last word from Daniel, and then um, yeah. Let me continue with the MRV thing for Pitland. I haven't yes. mentioned about that at all. So um, one of the important things to set up is the reference level for Pitland, mm -hmm. especially Pitland restoration. We've been asked by BRG to, to develop this and uh, put all together the, the driver of emission, including deforestation, drainage, and also fire. So having fire emission plugged in into the reference level is very important. Of course, it is an interdecadal uh, episode, but we can expect, you know, uh, within 10 years you have one or two uh, spike of emission due to fire, and we forgot that numbers plug in into the reference level. And uh, it will be in the hand of BRG how to use this in terms of restoration and fire avoidance. That's, that's the thing that we, we need to promote that as well. Thank you. Um, let me give the, the audience a, a five-minute warning that we'll open for questions in a few minutes. So please uh, start to type your questions. Also, brief comments. Uh, you're welcome to make them. We have a team here in the front that will select uh, questions and put them up on screen. Um, so I'll, I'll call for that shortly. Um, let me come back um, for f with one question to, um, to Minister from Republic of Congo. Um, this is also an issue of, of climate justice. Uh, we, we have to recognize that obviously um, there are countries in the EU, Canada, the US, that have explored peatlands for centuries. The ecosystems are very different in the tropics. It's th the same use is not possible. The rate of degradation, drainage is much faster. But in principle, uh, it is an issue of uh, countries that are developing being asked to uh, choose different development pathway, pathways. What kind of international support uh, does the Republic of Congo, do you need to make the case to your colleagues, the Minister of Oil, Minister of Energy, uh, to protect and conserve these peatlands? Écoutez, euh, nous avons vraiment besoin, urgentement, urgentement, de ce que l'Indonésie a mis en place, c'est-à-dire avoir déjà euh, des, des, des cartes qui nous permettent déjà d'identifier exactement les zones sur notre territoire où nous avons les tourbières et où nous avons les mangroves. Parce que, euh, vous savez, pour la petite histoire, on n'a pas eu le temps d'en parler après l'IMT de Brazzaville. Pendant que L'après euh, la journée officielle des travaux de Brazzaville, il y a des scientifiques qui étaient là, ceux qui ont découvert d'ailleurs euh, les tourbières de, euh, entre la République démocratique du Congo et mon pays. Et ils ont fait une expédition, pas dans, le, le centre, dans la zone repérée officiellement, la cuvette centrale, et du côté de Brazzaville, le lac Télé, qui se situe à pratiquement à 500 km du centre où nous étions, Mais ils ont fait une petite expédition d'une heure de route de la capitale Brazzaville. C'était assez curieux. Et on a découvert des tourbières qu'il y avait à une heure de route de Brazzaville. Mais c'était sur, euh, euh, un, sur une, une concession privée. Des personnes qui ne savaient même pas que ce, ces zones marécageuses, c'était des tourbières. Alors les scientifiques sont revenus Je, les, je suis allée les rencontrer à leur hôtel, dans tout leur équipement, mais ils étaient dans une joie immense parce qu'ils avaient prélevé des échantillons de, 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 de végétaux qui indiquent la présence de tourbières. Et ils avaient remarqué que c'était des, des, des végétaux exceptionnels qu'on retrouvait dans certaines mêmes zones européennes qui n'avaient rien à voir avec les tropiques. Donc ils se sont dit, il y a vraiment encore beaucoup de travail scientifique à faire pour comprendre ces écosystèmes. Donc l'urgence pour nous, elle est déjà de bien identifier ces lieux. Pourquoi Parce que nous avons les populations, les peuples autochtones, les communautés, on ne l'a pas évoqué tout à l'heure, qui vivent de chasse, de cueillette, d'une économie de l'agriculture. Et là, dans l'urgence, nous avons dû les sensibiliser, faire de la pédagogie. Le gouvernement s'est engagé, parce que le chef de l'État a pris personnellement le problème à son niveau, la problématique, 
et il m'a demandé de faire une communication au Conseil de ministre pour impliquer tous les départements qui interviennent sur le plan du foncier, parce qu'il nous faut un plan d'aménagement des terres, très très rapidement. Euh, il nous faut avoir une politique euh, d'économie de, 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 alternative pour les populations, parce que, euh, je venais de vous le dire, euh, nous allons certainement aller vers une agriculture durable que nous avons déjà commencé à mettre en place, parce que nous, nous avons une agriculture qui se base déjà dans les cadres des savanes que nous avions mises en place, oui, mais maintenant, il nous faut aussi savoir comment créer peut-être, moi je suis dans le tourisme également, excusez-moi, rendre l'économie du tourisme dans ces zones d'écosystèmes très fragiles, ce qui est un fort potentiel. Parce que parmi les jeunes scientifiques ou les jeunes congolais que j'ai envoyés pour monter un spot que nous avons monté pendant l'IMT, certains journalistes sont revenus en me disant euh, « Nous avons découvert ces arbres que nous voyons sur, en télé, à la télé à, dans, dans l'émission euh, Géogra Géographie Park, je pense. » Vous savez, ces arbres, lorsque vous coupez une racine, qui ont pratiquement 2 litres, 3 litres d'eau. Et ce qu'ils voyaient ailleurs, ils pensaient que c'était très très loin de nous, nous l'avions en fin de compte au Congo-Brazzaville, et les populations, en fin de compte, les autochtones le savaient, parce qu'ils se sont retrouvés en plein marécage, ils avaient soif, ils n'avaient plus d'eau, et ils ont vu l'un des guides locaux, je dis guide, ce n'est pas un guide, mais c'est vraiment un des membres de la communauté qui vit de cueillette et qui connaît bien cet environnement pour y vivre assez régulièrement, et il a simplement euh, déraciné euh, une racine, comme ça, sans fil de terre. Mais, mais vraiment, pour lui, c'était un acte naturel. Et il a entaillé des deux bouts en expliquant aux journalistes qu'il euh, qui, qui aurait de l'eau, qui était de l'eau pure, en fin de compte. Donc, euh, et on a découvert également, euh, dans des échantillons qui ont été prélevés, qu'il risque d'y avoir euh, euh, ce que le Congo-Brazzaville regorge, de l'énergie fossile ce qu'on appelle communément le pétrole. Et donc, au niveau des gouvernants, nous nous disons, nous voulons préserver, adapter, atténuer, oui, mais que faisons-nous dans l'urgence pour créer cette nouvelle économie qui nous permette de préserver pour le reste de la planète Parce que je vous l'ai dit tout à l'heure, le Congo-Brazzaville, c'est 69% de forêts, avec un taux de, de, de déforestation qui est de 0,052% qui est, je pense, le taux le plus bas au monde. Bon, jusqu'à présent, nous n'avons pas vraiment dégradé ces écosystèmes. Mais comme on nous demande maintenant, nous avons été au One Planet Summit, où, où, où là, tous les gouvernements de la planète ont décidé d'arrêter avec euh, les économies relatives aux, aux fossiles, à l'énergie fossile, vers nous tourner vers une économie plus durable qui préserve notre planète, oui, mais à ce moment-là, nous nous disons, si nous commençons à nous désengager, que nous sommes dans le pacte mondial, nous sommes également dans la lance solaire, nous faisons toutes ces étapes pour entrer dans tout ce qui est durabilité, oui, mais entre-temps, il nous faut vraiment un appui financier pour préserver, parce qu'il y a ces communautés, il y a cette économie qu'il nous faut avoir pour, pour, pour pouvoir maintenir l'État. Oui. Donc c'est un peu devant ce dilemme où je lance vraiment un appel. C'est pour ça que je, je, je remercie une fois de plus mon collègue du gouvernement de la Norvège de nous avoir associés ici. Et lorsque j'ai vu cette, cette invitation, je vous avoue que j'avais un agenda qui ne me permettait pas d'arriver là, ce qui est arrivé relativement tardivement euh, par rapport aux engagements pris trois mois à l'avance. J'étais obligée de décommander tout ce qu'il y avait parce que j'ai compris qu'il nous faut venir urgemment ici faire ce plaidoyer pour que les pays du Sud, que nous sommes de façon majoritaire, que, 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 que nous n'avons aujourd'hui que 5% de captation de financement. Il nous faut aujourd'hui pouvoir dire aux pays du Nord, s'il vous plaît, s'il vous plaît, nous savons, il y a l'Antarctique, nous savons qu'il y a tout ça, mais il y a urgence à gérer ces écosystèmes fragiles qui sont des bombes à retardement pour nous qui découvrons ce qu'il y a. Parce que nous avons tout plein de problèmes. Nous avons le renforcement des capacités, nous avons les inventaires des ressources naturelles à mettre en place. Nous avons besoin, besoin, des grands besoins pour nous permettre d'être ce... ce, ce, ce cette humanité que nous portons en nous, 
Et, et c'est pour ça que lorsque la ministre de l'Indonésie est venue nous, nous faire part de ce partage d'expérience qui nous est, révèle euh, pratiquement des procédures qu'il nous faut mettre en place très rapidement et qu'elle a formulé cette invitation auquel, bien entendu, nous avons dit oui, nous serons présents, qu'il y aura la RDC, il y aura le Pérou, il y aura l'ONU Environnement. Euh, euh, nous sommes en, en quadripartite et je pense que j'ai compris même ici que il nous faut aller au-delà de l'IMT parce que chaque continent a des problématiques qui sont une pièce du puzzle qui permettent de préserver les équilibres fragiles de la planète. Parce que quand vous regardez le cas spécifique de, des pays du Nord, des pays nordiques, ici avec ces fentes des glaciers, vous comprenez que là aussi, il faut une prise en charge. Donc chaque continent a une problématique qui finalement est nécessaire, ce sont des pièces du puzzle, si je peux m'exprimer comme ça, qu'il faut mettre ensemble pour nous permettre réellement de, 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 de pouvoir unir nos forces pour réellement gérer et contrer ces personnes qui pensent que les problèmes de changement climatique ne sont pas réels. Aujourd'hui, nous vivons des érosions, nous vivons des questions de déréglementation climatique dans le cadre de l'agriculture, où selon les régions au Congo, on a constaté que des, 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 des semences à une certaine période que, que, que l'on pouvait cultiver, nous ne pouvons plus le faire. Nous avons les montées des eaux, nous avons également, nous perdons trois mètres de côte. Le Congo-Brazzaville, c'est 180 000 km de, 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 de côte fluviale et sur le plan de la mer du littoral côtier. Et nous nous rendons compte que nous perdons, en le cas des flux euh, de changement climatique de l'eau, 3 mètres de, 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 de berges chaque année. Nous perdons des pans entiers d'îles qui disparaissent, pas au rythme peut-être des états insulaires, mais ça devient préoccupant, très préoccupant. Donc vous voyez, est, il est important, vraiment important, c'est vraiment, en anglais, on dit, il faut nous aider. Help, help. On en a vraiment besoin. <laughs> voilà. Thank you for that uh, passionate plea, uh, <laughs> Minister. And um, I, uh, I also, in particular, note that request for more scientific support as well. And I think this is, um, this is on the way. It's coming. I think uh, Simon Lewis and his team, who published in Nature, they're on their way back uh, to the Congo for a more uh, in-depth mapping. Um, but also a collaboration north-south that uh, is uh, supporting capacity, that is south-south, learning from Indonesia's lessons, and from the emerging science called paludiculture, which is a new word I learned recently. It's the science of sustainable use of peatlands. So what can you do with peatlands? Which trees grow there that you can harvest sustainably? Uh, what f uh, fisheries, uh, what other forms of use? Can you do their non-timber forest products? But that is an emerging science that uh, needs to be sped up uh, quite rapidly so we know what we can do. Also, uh, I will just leave this hanging uh, because I don't think we will have a lot of time. I want to turn to the audience now for questions. But the, uh, the, the choice in the Congo Basin and with the Cuvette Centrale between hydropower from the Congo River, for which the Cuvette Centrale is essential because it regulates the Congo River flow, or oil exploration, uh, I think there are choices to be made in the near future where experience from Norway can help. Uh, you've experienced with both those uh, topics uh, and uh, I think this would be an interesting uh, entry point to that discussion that goes beyond forests and beyond red uh, because there are important development choices that those countries are making uh, right now. Uh, I have a signal from the team here. We have questions uh, which will now come up on the screen. Um, I will read them to you here because I don't think you can, you can see uh, that screen or you can turn around and strain <laughs> your neck, but I'll just read out the questions. Um, the first one is we've heard a little about the role of communities in managing mangroves, but not so much on the role of women in this context. Can you say more on the role of women in, in mangrove management. I will um, pass uh, that question to Catherine because I know that both her, also Daniel, have researched uh, in that area. If I can have one more question, we'll take two or three and then pass them on. Is there another one? What are the most promising ways of funding mitigation 
measures for mangroves, is there a role for the private sector? Funding mitigation measures, uh, carbon markets, perhaps other possible responses. Um, if we can have one more, we'll group a few questions. How difficult or easy is it for governments to do MRV on mangrove carbon? So quite a bit of interest here on, on mangroves. Um, let me start with the, uh, with the role of, of uh, women. And uh, maybe, Daniel, you can start. Catherine, if you have something to add afterwards. Right. So uh, I think going straight into mitigation on mangrove is a bit hard. So one has to be very innovative in combining mitigation and adaptation and other uh, services that mangrove can uh, provide. That's why we, we can you know, attract more uh, possibilities in terms of how community can benefit from the presence of mangrove. So it has to have a very wide range of services. Uh, Catherine mentioned about uh, tourism, about um, uh, birds and animal and, and those kind of stuff and don't forget that this particular ecosystem is a place where you can do teleconnection for the for the biodiversity including birds migratory birds is very much uh, rely on the existence of mangrove and if that kind of thing can be you know explored how can the local community make benefit uh, of the presence of restored or protected mangrove. That's huge uh, dollar or whatever currency you are talking about if mangrove is kept intact. And uh, on, on the gender issue, uh, my colleague told me it's, it's not my area, but it's very important to learn that uh, most of fishing community uh, are dominated by women in terms of their present, day-to-day -day presence because the men travel and you know catch fish somewhere else, and that can be f months. And if if you engage women in any kind of activities in coastal community, that's that's very the the very way to go. I guess we understand that gender indeed plays a big role in, in mangrove conservation, in particular in some areas. Um, do you want to elaborate on that point? Sorry, which gender uh, uh, in mangrove conservation? Yeah. W um, there's a couple of projects that we, that we could talk about. Right? One is from Papua New Guinea. This is work done by the Nature Conservancy. And they have sort of got together kind of um, a group of, uh, of women conservation, um, women-led, female-led conservation organisations. The one from New Guinea is great because the women are working on managing their mangroves to enhance their mud crab fishery. So there's also another group in West Papua that uh, Park Daniel told me about. And uh, these are producing, um, you know, these very large mud crabs that have very high value, uh, particularly in the, you know, restaurant business, uh, uh, in uh, tourism centres. So, um, and, and these are, you know, like the, this is the purview of the um, women of those communities, right? So it can be uh, very powerful. I, I work, um, also work in Myanmar, and uh, in the community that um, we've started our project in, um, the women there are extremely interested in crab hatcheries, you know, because basically they're fisher people, they're, they're doing their business, and for crabs, and even in, you know, the atolls of the, of the Pacific, you know, the, cra the crabs form, um, you know, like, like they're really important on a daily basis. For It's, it's kind of like you want dinner, you go out to the mangrove and get it, right? So, um, you know, they're really important for that um, immediate provisioning service. And coming to that question on the private sector and mangroves, yeah, uh, Tim, uh, uh, Anna oui? sur uh, cette uh, vraiment première question, si vous permettez. Vous yeah. savez, uh, au bord du fleuve Congo, du côté Brazzaville, parce qu'il y a le côté Kinshasa, mais je vous parle là du côté Brazzaville, nous avons deux grandes mangroves. Uh, Et à côté de ces mangroves, chez nous, en fin de compte, dans l'agriculture traditionnelle, la femme étant, en termes de démographie majoritaire au Congo, nous sommes pratiquement 52% de la population. L'agriculture artisanale est faite par les femmes. Et généralement, dans les centres urbains, parce que nous privilégions également dans les zones urbaines l'agriculture, 
nous sommes en train d'aller vers ça dans le cadre d'une imp meilleure implémentation, en fin de compte, de la préservation de l'environnement. Et nous avons remarqué que la femme étant très impliquée dans les communautés, pas seulement urbaines, mais même dans le cas des départements, et en fin de compte, la mieux placée, nous n'avons pas réellement euh, euh, parlé avec ces femmes pour l'instant de, de tourbières, de mangroves, mais naturellement, elles ont réussi, on l'a constaté, à épargner ces, ces écosystèmes fragiles, et c'est elle, en fin de compte, qui a monté un réseau, un réseau associatif au Congo-Brazzaville, qui ont participé même pendant l'IMT. Vous avez remarqué cette dame des peuples autochtones qui a pris la parole, qui va nous accompagner même en Indonésie, qui milite pour la meilleure gestion durable, en fin de compte, de tous ces écosystèmes-là. C'est pour vous dire que la nature sait faire les choses et que, naturellement, ces choses ont pris place chez nous avant même que les gouvernants ont mis en place le régulateur que nous sommes, c'est-à-dire une politique en la matière. Maintenant, avec mon collègue, parce que nous avons encore un ministère en charge de la promotion de la femme, parce que malheureusement, nous sommes majoritaires dans le monde, ah, mais, mais ces messieurs, il faut donner des coudes pour pouvoir un peu s'imposer, avoir un peu le lead parmi eux. Et donc, aujourd'hui, avec la collègue, on a mis en place justement un réseau de femmes qu'on a identifié pour les pousser justement à mettre en place des, des, des politiques de sensibilisation, d'éducation pour la prise en compte justement de la gestion durable de ces mangroves. Voilà. Uh, if I could follow up one, one question on the mangroves on the private sector. Have you any experience, and this is for, for anyone on the panel, with the private sector investments in conservation or restoration of, of mangroves? Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel, perhaps? Yes, yes uh, in fact one of our research sites is owned uh, by private sector. It's a huge concession for mangrove logging. Um, the way it is locked, uh, there is no such technical guidelines how to do it. So they completely follow ho how to do it in the terrestrial system. Mm. But they are very innovative in handling this uh, because as it was mentioned that most of carbon stored in mangrove ecosystem are in the soil. So they copy the trees, they will sprout and come back And more importantly is they are very innovative in finding how to find a spot to cut the trees and they use the system called keyhole uh, system so that you have uh, cutting the, cut the, the area which is like uh, the whole of you know, keyhole so that the rest of the landscape is protected. Only, only the area which are locked and the area which are used for transporting the locks. And uh, we measured what's going on with the carbon in the soil after 25, 15, 10, and 5 years of cutting. And surprisingly, um, the soil carbon stock is not much different across this uh, logging uh, cycle. So that relates to what uh, MRV should do. So if you are talking about mangrove for logging or mangrove for aquaculture, what is the driver? That, that should be different. So uh, in that sense, uh, mangrove for aquaculture is only nine years in terms of you know, uh, production. Uh, one cycle is nine years. After that, everything's gone. And people tend to leave the area for um, somewhere else. And um, that's, that's the problem with that. So MRV should take care of uh, the uh, soil carbon. Of course, the source of carbon is, is trees, are trees and also the, the existence of roots to trap the sediment. But measuring soil carbon is, is quite something. And uh, many countries do not have that uh, mangrove as part of forest. So it depends how, how mangrove will be part of forest in, in their definition. So in, in countries where mangrove are forests, that can be can be immediately adopted in, in the forest. Also. Yeah, I think that's a very important point related to the objective of the session. How can we better integrate mangroves and peatlands into red and other climate strategies. We have only a uh, little less than 10 minutes left. I think we have time for one more volley of questions um, coming from the audience, and then we will uh, need to ra wrap up. Um, first question is, I observe considerable confusion surrounding the definition, practicality, and implications of peatland forest restoration. 
um, especially drain peatlands in Indonesia. How can we do better? Clearly a question for Mark Nazir, I think. Uh, so uh, there's confusion surrounding the definition, practicality, and implications of peatland forest restoration. Next question. What are the main drivers of deforestation of mangroves? We've already uh, heard a little bit about that um, from, from uh, Daniel. Uh, you visited recently a, a mangrove project in Myanmar. Maybe you've observed uh, something there as well. Um, we have, um, yeah, we'll hear a little bit more about that. Can we have one more question? Integrating tourism, research, and education values in mangroves and peatlands could help to build a case for their conservation versus exploitation or other uses, in addition to carbon value. In your experience, how can we obtain and communicate such values? The minister just spoke about uh, some of those, those aspects. So integrating tourism, research, and education in mangroves and, and peatlands. Um, let me start with the, with the first question to, to Parnassia. So, Peatland forest restoration, um, personally, I'm not sure what the confusion is, but maybe you can say in Indonesia, are there clear definitions? If not, how, can we, how could we improve that? Yeah, when we are talking about peatland restoration, um, there are two um, schemes of the restoration, let's say. The first one uh, is the hydrological restoration. So the pit draining needs to be stopped, the draining. Uh, the building dams or other infrastructure and reweb or reflap uh, if possible the peatland. So we're talking about hydrological restoration. Second, we talk about vegetation restoration, so it's reforestation. Um, both are needed, uh, important for areas of peatland, the pit domes that need for be a conservation purposes because if we increase the water table by improving the water hydrological system, but there is not enough tree cover. Uh, the humidity will also drop because of the sun radiation during the dry seasons. Uh, it means the compositions will uh, be quicker. It means greenhouse gas emission uh, will be higher. Um, that's why I have to do both hydrologic restoration as well as the vegetation restoration. Okay. Thank you very much for that um, clarification. And um, if I can turn to uh, the question of drivers of mangrove uh, degradation and deforestation. We heard a little bit about that already. Uh, you, you told me you planted mangrove trees in Myanmar uh, during a visit. Uh, so what had driven the, the, the deforestation? I planted then? one tree, so that was, <laughs> my, that was my contribution. So I hope, I, I hope it's still there. Uh, but I think the drivers were, were talked about earlier. It's uh, fish farming, or it's also, uh, or it's also uh, farming as such. Uh, way, way how uh, that's driving against peatlands. Uh, but I think what I would well like to state that with the Norwegian uh, Climate and Forest Initiative, uh, I have also earlier on from Parliament, I've tried to make uh, the, the preservation of uh, peatlands and mangroves. Um, a larger part of that initiative. With the, uh, with the, the partner countries where we have uh, established cooperation like Indonesia, but also Brazil and, uh, and others. And I think that with the numbers and what we hear and also the added on benefits, the don't doubt that this is something that we work uh, on and uh, work also more on uh, for the years ahead. And also to respond to, respond to the, the minister. Of course, also for us, it's important to look at also the Congo Basin being the second most important forest in the world, and also with the peatlands that are there. Uh, but of course, it is it is a cooperation that has to be, to be established uh, step by step, because uh, it, it is also uh, with the DRC and countries where we have we have had difficulties. Uh, but that is not to say that it is the importance of the forests and the peatlands are such that I believe that Norway we should stay engaged, uh, just like other sh other countries uh, should also, and then try to move on um, a cooperation with the quality that is needed, and that is I think that uh, what we have to work on. 
We are uh, unfortunately quite rapidly uh, running out of time, uh, and I, I would like to ask um, if, if uh, every panelist uh, would give us a little uh, closing word uh, linking back to the objective of this session, how to better integrate these highly important ecosystems into national strategies, um, and uh, then we would uh, like to close. Uh, one uh, quick uh, announcement is that this afternoon at 5 p.m., I believe, at the House of Literature, there is an event afterwards where some of these uh, aspects can be discussed in more detail, and, and I would encourage all of you to go. It's a, just a short walk down the street. Um, also, the Global Peatlands Initiative has uh, issued a publication last year called Smoke on Water. So if you Google Smoke on Water Peatlands, you get a, first a uh, rock song from Deep Purple from the 1970s, but right after that you get uh, our publication on peatlands that has all these maps, all the information, and we have uh, also uploaded on the conference website um, background information on mangroves. Uh, and with that also thanks to the team here from Nick Fee and Nora that put this event together. Uh, with that now, let me turn to um, a closing word, very briefly, please, um, uh, tweetable if possible, uh, uh, on how we can really better integrate the protection, restoration of these ecosystems in our national climate strategies. Daniel? Yeah, well, both peatland and mangrove are low-hanging fruits, and uh, we've been saying this many, many years ago, uh, but I'm wondering why it's not getting picked up. So I think we need to, to do that more seriously. It is, it is there and will benefit a lot of people and also the, the planet. So after this event, everybody will pick the low-hanging fruit. Panasia? <laughs> yeah, uh, we believe there is a new economic models that can be uh, pushed forward uh, from peatland and also mangrove. Uh, I believe I've seen some examples, maybe still a small scale, but uh, we need uh, support, we need cooperations with financial communities, with uh, private sector in boosting it to big economy scale. Yeah, thank you very much, Catherine. Mangroves can do mitigation and adaptation for coasts. So I think trying to include those together is really important. And I love the idea of lining up all of the ministries and ministers to talk about mitigation, adaptation, fisheries, uh, all of these things, you know, tied together, align the policies to make things really happen. Thank you, Minister. Pour la planète, je pense, uh, engageons-nous dans le combat commun, qui est celle de la préservation de ces écosystèmes fragiles, des mangroves, des tourbières. Pour, Merci. Uh, notre bien. À tous. Merci beaucoup. And the last word to our host, uh, Minister Elvis Doon. Well, uh, we will keep our commitments uh, with the NICF and, the, and the, from the Norwegian side. But on the other side, I think it's here, as with all uh, climate policies, is about having one thing that is the scale, but also the speed that we have to work on. I mean, really, for the sake of the planet, it's really about what we can do the next four, eight, 12 years. And this, that's also the importance also on this issue. And uh, from a Norwegian perspective, we also have, like other European countries, we had to contribute more internationally. Also, Norway, we need more partners. We have with Germany, we have with the, the UK, we, but we need more partners. But we also have to be better at doing our homework, also when it comes to peatlands, and also on restoration projects. An issue of urgency and importance. Thank you very much. Please give a hand to the panel and to yourselves. Thank you for coming.